Okay, so, dun, da, da, dun. so conflict in intercultural encounters is, it, it's really unavoidable um, because you have miscommunications, you have people speaking different languages, you have people whose nonverbals uh, don't all quite mean the same thing. So when conflict arises, there's different ways that people deal with it. And we have this nice little beautiful graphic up here um, about how people um, deal with conflict, the different conflict styles. So Americans tend to be very direct. So we tend to be at this top half. Um, and then a lot of the times we tend to be more emotionally expressive. Um, but not always, obviously, because everyone is an individual. So you can either be direct or indirect and then emotionally um, restrained or emotionally expressive. And if you guys do the reading, um, I believe that it is here in the reading. That graphic should be in there and it should also, um, well, actually, here's just the, the approaches for it but I don't think they have the beautiful graphic like I did. But feel free to go check those out. There's also this conflict management lecture in there if you'd like to watch it. Um, but being able to manage conflict, whether it be intercultural conflict or just conflict in your regular relationships is very important. So actually I'm gonna go back over there. Um, so, when you're engaged in conflict so let's say that um let's say that bren just got married let's say bren just got married to javen and they're thinking of buying a new couch bren really wants this type of couch and javen really wants this other type of couch um, they may not be, you know, in physical conflict, literally fighting over what kind of couch, but it is still a conflict because their goals are different. So when you engage in conflict, some things to ask yourself is what is your goal? So why are you engaged in this conversation? You know, in Bryn and Javen's case, it might be because they are trying to find a new couch. Um, but they want to come to a consensus in order to purchase this couch. They want it to be, you know, affordable and they want it to look nice and they want it to be super comfy. Um, you know, and you have to realize that, you know, it is a partnership. You need to be partners in this conflict, not adversaries. So you are trying to come to a conclusion together rather than trying to win the other, win over the other person or win the argument. Um, and you need to be focused on listening, particularly listening more and speaking less. So really trying to understand where the other person is coming from. You should have hopefully some charitable assumptions. So people's intentions are often better than you think they are. Most people are not out to get you. Like Bryn doesn't want this particular type of couch just to annoy Javen. So she wants that type of couch because that's just what she likes. And, you know, Javen's not, you know, liking this other type of couch just because he knows that Bryn hates it. It's just, that's what he likes. So have charitable assumptions. People are not always out to get you and their intentions tend to be more positive than you may first assume. Um, don't just stand there and deliver your message and talk at the other person. Um, it, it should not be a monologue. It should be a dialogue. Um, walk away if necessary. Um, don't push it to a breaking point where, you know, you've pushed it past the point of no return. You can always walk away. Um, don't fall into this sunk cost fallacy of, well, I've put so much effort into it. I have to see it through. You don't always have to. Sometimes things are just not going to work. You're not going to be able to convince people of things or to, you know, people just don't always want to listen. So you can walk away. Um, model the behavior you want to see in others. So listen, be polite, um, so that the other people are understanding like the, 
that is what you want from them as well. Um, ask good questions. So ask good calibrated questions um, in order to help you understand what the person's actually saying and to show that you are actively listening to them and don't blame. So, you know, oh, well, you know, Javen just wants this type of couch because blah, 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 or he's just doing it because he know it's gonna make me mad or whatever. Don't, don't blame, discuss the contributions that you both have put towards the conversation and learn and try to find out what is closing or what is causing the person to be closed minded or really, really stubborn on whatever issue. Um, so yeah, now that we had that really quick overview of that, let's actually go into this. So conflict is always happening. You have a lot of interpersonal conflict, which is, you know, just between people. So like if Bryn and Javen are trying to figure out what type of couch to buy, that is interpersonal conflict. Um, you have political conflict. So societal level conflict over political issues, um, particularly in election years. And then you have international conflict, which is between nations or between countries. So our current international conflict is, of course, North Korea. I don't want to say as always, but in the past decade, North Korea seems to always be involved, right? Um, but North Korea has recently tested a couple new uh, missiles in the Sea of Japan. Obviously, this is concerning because North Korea is not a very friendly country to democratic societies in general. Um, so this is one of the things that currently it's not international conflict, uh, but it could progress to that point. So when you think of war, that is international conflict. Um, if it's internal war or civil war, that might be more political. Um, and then, of course, if people are arguing, that is interpersonal. So um, we're going to, I guess we'll mention that. Um, so some of the characteristics of interpersonal conflict specifically is that it can be kind of ambiguous. You may not be exactly sure what the other person is saying based on a myriad of issues. Um, so it can make it difficult. Um, you may have just language issues or a language barrier that you have to get over or your conflict style. So how you deal with conflict might be different. So if you're dealing with conflict in a very direct way, but your conversation partner is a very indirect um, stylist, I guess, then you're probably not going to be able to solve anything or you're not going to be able to solve it very easily. And just conflict in general, it can either be real or perceived incompatibility. So conflict is not always caused by something real. You could just perceive or assume there is some incompatibility of goals or values, expectations, insert whatever here, of two or more groups that are interdependent, so they have to deal with each other in some way, shape, or form. Um, so that ambiguity, um, if you're unsure of anything, we typically resort to whatever our default is. Because if something is uncertain, we go, we want to go back to whatever is certain. So if I am unsure of how to deal with the situation um, with, you know, a partner or a friend who is a different culture from me, then I will go back to the default style of what I learned from my parents um, and their conflict management skills. Um, language issues, like I mentioned briefly, language issues can create conflict just if you don't understand um, like what they're saying. What was that like TikTok trend or whatever that I saw a couple weeks ago? Um, it was like, you know, tell me something in your language that, you know, sounds bad in English or whatever. So if someone is speaking another language and someone just overhears something that might cause conflicts, they're like, wait, what'd you just call me or what'd you just say about me? It's like nothing. I wasn't even talking in English. Like, calm down. 
Um, but if can you guys think of any examples of language issues creating conflict in your own personal lives um, and things you've seen? There's probably a lot of like really good movie clips from this. Um, but if anyone can think of any, just throw it into the chat and I'll pull it up. So if you can think of any like movie scenes where language issues cause conflict, post it in the chat and we will pull it up and watch it before we leave. Different cultures also have different conflict styles. That was that little like graphic that we showed at the very beginning. Uh, but if your styles are contradictory, then it's going to be really hard to get anything done. But if you have two people who are both direct, then it's like, okay, here's the problem. What are we going to do about it? But if you have direct and then an indirect, it might be like, uh, well, why aren't you telling me what the problem is so I can fix it? So, um, there, so there's the styles of conflict and there's also the types of conflict. So let's go to this really quick. So these are once again, our conflict style. So you have direct and indirect, and then you have restrained, and then you have expressive. So if you are indirect and restrained, uh, this is an accommodation style. So if you're indirect and expressive, it is dynamic. If you are expressive and direct, you are using the engagement. And if you are direct but restrained, it is called discussion style. Um, so it's last year when we talked about this, I had a really small class and um, every everyone picked out which conflict style they thought they were. Um, and it was it was interesting because most of the women in the class considered themselves accommodators. Um, and the two men in the class, um, I think they decided that they fell under discussion. So just an interesting observation. But yeah, you guys will read more about this in the reading from this week. So I'm not going to go over too much about it. Um, but there's different types of conflict as well. So you have effective conflict. So when people, they know their feelings and emotions are incompatible. You have conflict of interest, which is where people have um, incompatible preferences over a course of action or a plan, a value conflict, which is different ideologies, um, a cognitive, so where someone's thought process or perceptions are in conflict, or a goal conflict. So when people disagree about a preferred goal or end state. So an effective conflict might be um, like if you're in one-sided love um, or obsessed with someone, your feelings are not compatible with their feelings because you might love them or be obsessed with them, but they aren't with you. There's probably also a lot of good movie scenes about that. Um, a conflict of interest. So let's say, let's go back to our hypothetical married Bryn and Javen. So maybe Bryn gets this awesome job offer that is in Denver, but Javen has a really, really good job where they live in Houston. So Bryn really, really wants to take this good job in Denver, but that means that Javen would have to leave his really great job in Houston. So Bryn might want to move and Javen might want to stay. So their preferences for a course of action are incompatible. So they'd either have to find a way around that or someone would have to say, okay, we'll move or we'll stay. Value conflicts are different ideologies. Um, basically, if you think of any religious conflict ever, it's a value conflict, pretty much. Um, so cognitive conflict, so their thought processes or perceptions are in conflict or different. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example from this one. Um, so if you're perceiving that one of your friends is being superbly rude to you or insert whatever here and they're perceiving that they're not 
Um, that could be a cognitive conflict. And then of course a goal conflict. So um, just a conflict about you guys disagree about what the preferred end goal is. So uh, maybe Bryn and Javen, you know, maybe Javen really, really wants to get married and Bryn doesn't. So that could be a goal conflict because um, the end state would be marriage or not marriage. So sorry, Bryn and Javen, I hope that's not like too awkward for you, but those are just like the two names that I picked out of the, the attendance list. Okay. Um, and then we're gonna end on the importance of conflict. So that's slide 11. So, or that's the importance of context. Sorry, I'm still thinking conflict. Um, but honestly, conflict is really important to have too because you can have productive conflict and productive arguments. Um, but context is very important when talking about conflict. Because um, you can look at it as a society or the actual situation. So societal conflict it can be good because it can cause positive change. So if you take a look and see what's been going on in the past couple years um, with you know instances of police brutality and Black Lives Matter, that has been societal conflict. Um, but you have to look at it in the context of you know people are trying to make their lives better and make things more equal. Um, and then an actual situation. So what is the context of the actual situation? So that would be looking at like specific instances of, you know, Ferguson, Missouri, man, that was a long time ago. Um, or, um, you know, the Breonna Taylor instances and what happened there in the responses to that. Um, so what was the actual situation? And then what's it, what's going on in society that is leading to it and how is it productive conflict or destructive conflict? And there are instances that can be a little bit of both too. Obviously we want to aim for productive conflict um, where we're starting to try to make things better and working towards a goal where, you know, more people are happy or more people are better served by their community rather than a destructive conflict. Um, but you have to look at contact or conflict in what specifically is happening and then what's happening in society as well. Um, so I, apparently we are over time. I'm going to stop the recording.